uh, I'm going to start the meeting. So welcome everybody to uh, our uh, systems and model synthesis workshop, Simon's uh, Institute workshop. Uh, today we are going to focus on uh, the synthesis of uh, cyber physical systems. And we have uh, uh, they a very, very famous and uh, very good speakers. And uh, I'm going to start with the first one, uh, Karim Belta, who is a professor in the Department of Me Mechanical Engineering at Boston University, where he holds the Tegan family uh, distinguished uh, faculty fellowship. He's also the director of the Boston University Lab uh, and of the Center for Autonomous uh, and Robotic Systems, uh, short cars, and is also affiliated with the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and the Department and the Division of Systems Engineering at Boston University. His research focuses on dynamics and control theory with a particular emphasis on hybrid and cyber physical systems formal synthesis and verification and robotics. Uh, notable awards include the SF Career Award, 2008 AFOSR Young Investigator Award, uh, and uh, 2000 the IEEE TCNS Outstanding Paper Award. He's an uh, IEEE Fellow and a Distinguished Lecturer of the IEEE uh, Control System Society. Karin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rado. Let me share my screen. Can you guys see my PowerPoint thing? Yes. Yes, we can see. Let's see if I, I always have issues going to presentation mode, but uh, let me give it a try. How is this, guys? Can, can you actually Excellent. see Excellent. Yeah, perfect. Oh, perfect. OK. All right. All right. Good morning, everybody. And uh, again, Radu, thanks a lot for the, uh, for the invitation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about an optimization-based approach to um, synthesis of control strategies for dynamical systems with the emphasis on, uh, on safety. And uh, the work that I'm going to show was mostly done by, uh, can you guys see my mouse too? Yep. Yeah. By this guy. His name is Wei Shao. Um, he's my student at Boston University, but this work was actually done while he was at um, Emotional, an internal Emotional, where I also have an affiliation. So I'm not sure how much you know about Motional, but it's, this company is exactly one year old yesterday. So it was, uh, it has its roots in autonomy and active. And then it was, um, was formed as a uh, joint venture between active and Hyundai. So now it's uh, kind of like all over the globe and they do autonomous cars. Okay, so uh, no surprise that uh, the motivation for the work that I'm gonna show today comes from autonomous driving which is an important but challenging problem. Um, we have to deal with uh, realistic vehicle dynamics, which can be high dimensional and highly nonlinear. Most of the time, this problem is posed as a optimal control problem where we have to optimize the cost, such as energy, distance traveled, um, deviation from a um, reference trajectory. The environment can be quite complex and can be changing, can be partially known. Um, autonomous cars have local limited sensing, which can also be noisy. And um, last but not least, and actually with particular relevance to this talk, we need to satisfy rules. And these rules can be literally traffic laws, such as um, stop at the traffic light, stay in lane, um, keep clearance from parked cars, from pedestrians. Uh, satisfy the speed limits, but can also be uh, comfort uh, requirements, such as um, you know, some sort of a notion of uh, keep jerk low. Uh, and obviously, they come with priorities. Obviously, you want to pay more attention to um, keeping clearance from pedestrians than satisfying the speed limits. So satisfying rules involves some sort of a global notion of uh, minimum violation also because most of the time they're in conflict with each other. There is, uh, especially in heavy traffic, there's no way you can satisfy all the rules. And here's an example that I'm gonna um, um, come back. I'm actually showing kind of the solution at the beginning and then I'm gonna come back to the, at the end of the talk and I'm gonna um, revisit this example after I show some of the technical approach behind it. So the dynamics that I'm showing in here, which I'm not going to go through details, is this is um, seven-dimensional and it's actually defines, defined along a reference trajectory. So what I want to, to notice is that it's high-dimensional, it's non-linear. 
uh, we need to solve an optimal control problem. The trajectory tracking that we do in this case, let me run this movie to, while I do this. Um, I'm not sure why I can see, see this label there. The uh, trajectory tracking that we do in this case is um, uh, stay as close as possible to the middle of the current lane. There are state limitations such as steering angle, vehicle speed. There are tight control bounds and uh, we want to achieve some sort of a global um, satisfaction of a um, prioritized set of rules. And the set of rules that we have uh, here, I cannot see them. I'm showing here at the top, the uh, abbreviation stands for, TORC stands for total order over equivalence relations. So what I'm showing in here is a set of eight rules. Priorities go from bottom to top. So at the top we have the highest priority rules and whatever I'm showing in uh, these rectangles, these are rules of, the, of equivalent priority. Okay, so one of the requirements that uh, we need to satisfy in here is safety. You can uh, look at this set of rules. Most of them are clearance type rules, which means that we need to make sure that while we drive around, we keep a certain distance between the ego and the uh, other traffic participants. And that formally translates to the notion of safety. And uh, what I'm showing here is the so-called CBF approach, control barrier function approach. And actually, Paul is one of the authors on this paper, which introduced this uh, Paul, you're, you're an author to this, right? <laughs> Paul, yeah. Okay, Paul is still there, good. So uh, they focused on a nonlinear system with a certain structure called the affine control systems where there is a drift and then the control enters affinely along the control directions in this matrix G. There are control bounds and um, the goal here is to make a set a forward invariant. And this set is described using a differential function D. And the uh, sufficient condition for this to happen is to satisfy this uh, equality, inequality, sorry. So if you can find U satisfying this for all X in C and for all U in U, then you can guarantee that if you start in C, you stay in C. So that's a notion of like, for example, if you start, if you start far away from the pedestrian, you're gonna stay far away from the pedestrian. And one thing that I wanted to notice in here is that this, uh, what you have on the right-hand side of this inequality is an affine function in U. If I, keep, if I uh, fix X, this is actually an affine function in U. And another thing we have to deal with in the problem that I showed is to actually go to specific states. Like for example, if you have a reference trajectory which is given as a sequence of points, then you have to go and visit every point. If you have a goal where you wanna go, then uh, again, you ought to make sure you converge there. And the approach that I'm proposing here, which is um, again uh, proposed by the same authors, is to use control Lyapunov functions. So same type of control system, control bounds, um, a scalar function which satisfies these two equations is called a control Lyapunov function. And if we find a CLF which such that for all u, this inequality is satisfied, then we are guaranteed that we have exponential uh, stabilization to the origin. And again, I want you to notice in here that uh, this inequality again is a affine function in U in the sense that if I kept X constant, then this is affine in U, which is the same applies to the dynamics of the system. So then is it to these two ingredients, I can formulate the uh, optimal control problem for this types of dynamics, obviously control bounds. Um, I uh, assume here a quadratic cost and um, we want to be safe and we're gonna impose safety with the CBF for the invariance of this set and convergence to a desired state with the CLFB. And formally, this translates to an optimization problem which looks like this. So if so, you were to- so if, Karin, so if you wouldn't have uh, the constraints, it would be just solving the Riccati equation, yeah? In every time step. Uh, if this was linear, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is linear when you when you fix x, yeah. So it's affine. So yeah, but I'm going to fix x here, and I'm going to get also something that's all um, yeah. that's simpler. But you know, my point was that let, if you just don't do anything and look at this optimization problem, it's hard because of yeah, the yeah, constraints yeah. are ugly. But again, what was proposed um, uh, by these people who, I don't know who these people are, but what they did, they proposed to, um, to take the time interval that you're interested in, zero to t, 
cut it into small pieces and then solve an optimization problem in each of these intervals. Mm -hmm. So for example, in here, at the beginning of an interval, um, you have a certain value for the state X. Then uh, you, you plug in that value in these constraints. So X is now constant and known. These are uh, linear inequalities in U, quadratic cost. Let's assume you use polyhedral. This becomes a QP. So you can solve this QP really quickly and really fast. Find the control, apply it, and keep it constant during all this time interval. Integrate forward in time, find the next state, and so on. Right, so this approach obviously is uh, computationally efficient. QPs can be solved very fast. Obviously, you play the price here, you become suboptimal. Also, convergence might not be guaranteed, but uh, if you cut this very, very finely, you might hope that actually everything is, uh, everything is going to be fine. Okay, so uh, in my group, uh, when we started looking into this, um, this approach, basically, I'm gonna, we started from the observation that in the original um, work, um, the sufficient conditions only work for relative degree one. So by relative degree here, I mean exactly relative degree the way it's defined in nonlinear control theory. It's uh, like an output function, function of the state, if you differentiate it once, you don't see the state means that it's relative, it's high relative degree and then you keep on differentiate it and uh, at some point you're gonna see the input. Basically more or less the same happens here because you have these lead derivatives. And I wanna show that even for a very simple control problem which is an adaptive cruise control problem and very simple dynamics, which is a double integrator in here, the original CBF approach would not work because uh, when you write down the CBF uh, um, condition, which is this one, you won't see the control because it vanishes. And again, those of you familiar with um, input top linearization would recognize that actually it's, you know, it's like a, a well-known issue. And then, uh, so this is one thing. And another thing, which is uh, actually the most important and a lot of people spend time on uh, uh, studying, this is the feasibility of the resulting QPs, right? So think of, um, a car moving in a uh, uh, moving in heavy traffic. There will be a lot of safety constraints coming from other cars, coming from pedestrians, coming from staying in lane. You would have to satisfy many constraints like this, and if you have tight control bounds, it's very likely the optimization problem will become infeasible. The constraint set would be empty, and that's particularly uh, the case because of the uh, myopic approach that we have in here. So we cut this uh, time into very small uh, pieces. And then again, we solve an optimization problem here. Then we apply the control. By the time we get here, plug in the state that we got after forward integration in time into these equations, you might get very close to an obstacle. One of the um, um, constraints might become active and uh, you become invisible and you're basically stuck. There's nothing you can do. So again, just very briefly, I'm gonna give you a, uh, I'm gonna, a very high level overview of um, our approach to deal with these two limitations. First of all, to, to deal with um, the, high, the relative degree problem, we proposed uh, high order control barrier functions. So very briefly, rather than just having one constraint, one function, we actually have M of them, where M is the relative degree of the, of the constraint. Each of them induces a set in the same way that uh, the original constraint induced a set. And then the main theorem here is that if we satisfy a uh, inequality, which looks uh, just slightly more general than the one that you saw before, then you can guarantee that the intersection of the sets is forward invariant. And in particular, C1 with some conservatism here, C1 is also a forward invariant and this is what you wanted to achieve. On the feasibility issue, uh, I'm gonna show two main ideas and the first idea with two different flavors. So um, one way to deal with feasibility that we proposed was to actually add more constraints, which is kind of counterintuitive because uh, we're infeasible because we have too many constraints, but somehow it makes sense to add more constraints to make the problem feasible. And these constraints that we add, we call them feasibility constraints. So I think maybe this picture would help a little bit um, clarify this uh, counterintuitive approach. So what I showed before in the traditional approach at some, at some time, you solve an optimization problem, you find the control, you keep it constant, you integrate forward in time, you end up somewhere. 
my mouse is kind of, can you guys see my mouse moving still? Yes, yes. Okay. You might end up in the state and this state you might, uh, you might be infeasible. Versus let's say that somehow you can characterize this uh, conflict situations and you can characterize them in such a way that you can come up with closed form, closed form differentiable expressions of, uh, of conditions which would ensure that this would not happen. And then this constraint, you would uh, enforce it using yet an extra CBF. So basically make sure that during while you evolve during the dynamics of the system, this constraint is set. So basically, think, so the, the, the constraint would be this function, right? So rather than just going here, because I know something bad will happen, I would actually go here. Again, I don't have many details, but there's, uh, if you're interested, I can provide the, the technical, technical description of this. But as I already said, the, um, the steps for this approach would be first to uh, find conflicts between constraints and then formulate constraints to avoid such conflicts and then find some sufficient condition that would enforce some such constraints and then write and then enforce the satisfaction of the sufficient conditions using CBF. And basically when you solve your optimization problem, in addition to what you had before, actually, by the way, I'm showing this for relative degree one because it's simpler to write, but we have a version that works for relative degree um, M. So in addition to your original safety constraints, you're also gonna have something like this where this function has an expression and there is a theorem that you have on how to construct this and depends both on uh, the original constraint, original constraint B and the control bounds that you have. Another approach to add feasibility constraint was to actually learn them, which is uh, quite intuitive. So, and also it shows to work for, um, it has some sort of a nice symmetry properties in the sense that if I can, if we can construct this for an obstacle of a certain geometry, we only tried spheres because that's the easiest case. But uh, if I constrain constraints for a sphere and move the sphere around, you can actually automatically generate uh, constraints for spheres placed anywhere. Let me write this movie, write the movie so I can actually see how it works. But the main idea is that, you know, once you have uh, an obstacle of a certain geometry, you start sampling very, very densely around the obstacle and literally at every point solve the CBF CLF problem and see if it's feasible or not. And if it's feasible, you label it with feasible. If it's unfeasible, you label it as unfeasible. And then, and then learn a classifier that nicely separates the feasible from unfeasible. And then uh, if you're careful, you can construct this classifier such that is differentiable. And then you, you impose the satisfaction of the classifier using yet an extra CBF that you add to your optimization problem. And again, you cannot prove much in here because again, you have some learning in here, but in practice, it seems to work quite nicely in pretty cluttered environment and with local sensing. And you see here, I'm all, uh, basically when you solve this optimization problem, this learning problem, sorry, you uh, solve it once, but then you can easily uh, translate it everywhere as long as you stick to the geometry that you had initially. And the second approach that we had for feasibility was to use something called adaptive CBF, which we called ADA CBF. And that's actually kind of tightly related to our definition of uh, high order control barrier function. Remember, these are the functions that we have, which are different from the ones that are uh, that I showed you before in the sense that now, rather than just having this class K functions here, we also have some penalties, which are uh, functions of time. So the, hence the name adaptive. So long story short, what we wanna do, we wanna uh, define auxiliary dynamics control systems for each penalties and use the controls in this uh, auxiliary dynamics to relax the constraints that we have in the original controls you from the original problem. So we need to make sure that this whole product stays a class K function. So we need to guarantee that uh, these PIs that we have here are positive. And then we enforce this using again, the CBF approach applied to this system. We don't have a clear understanding on how to construct this, but what we did so far, we just chose linear functions and it seems to work quite nicely. Obviously they can be maybe uh, extended and done better. 
And the theorem uh, that ensures for the invariance for C1 looks a little bit more complicated like this, but uh, what you can see in here, there is a um, relaxation uh, because we have this extra control variables. And then I'm, I'm not showing the cost in here, but obviously in the cost we'll have, actually we relax this one too, and this relaxation variable goes as a slack variable in the cost. Um, Again, given the short time, I'm not going to show any any details, but uh, there is a paper which actually will appear in transactions very soon, so you can uh, I can refer you to that. Okay, so here's uh, back to our original problem. Um, I want to solve an optimal control problem, obviously with the quadratic cost, because I'm going to use the method that I showed you before, subject to complicated dynamics. Um, the trajectory tracking that we're going to do here would be uh, following the middle of the current lane. The state limitation are steering angle, vehicle speed, the control bounds are jerk, steering acceleration, and uh, we want to achieve minimum violation of a prioritized set of rules. So just a few words on a few more words on this. So our approach to satisfying rules was inspired by uh, some earlier work by Andrea Sensi. I'm not sure how many of you guys might know him. He was, I think he was a postdoc with Emilio and ETH. Um, so they, uh, they defined this rule book as a set of rules uh, which are prioritized and for which um, you can uh, quantify satisfaction. Right, so if you think of, uh, if you look at this example here, so there is the ego and it has, uh, there are uh, four rules. One rule is to stay in lane, no collision, satisfy speed limit and uh, don't accelerate too much. And uh, so um, this violation score basically means that once you have a trajectory and a rule rather than just having Boolean satisfaction, meaning that the tra trajectory satisfies the rule or not, you want, to be, you want to quantify uh, the degree of satisfaction. Those of you familiar with STL, this is literally, actually it is that in some approaches that we have and other people did, but um, in what we have here is just maybe, it's actually a particular case of uh, STL formulas and robustness. So the robustness would give you the uh, degree of violation. So this is just one-sided robustness. We, at least in this, at least in this work, we don't, um, we don't reward um, good satisfaction. We just penalize bad violation. So once you have this, um, like for example, in here, you can, uh, I say what I'm doing on time. Um, we wanna, we wanna use the rule book to do trajectory comparison and hopefully rank trajectories. And here's a sim simple example. I have three trajectories, A, B, C. Which one is the best with respect to this priority structure? In this priority structure, again, remember we have um, priorities going up from bottom to top and uh, equivalent rules are showing in rectangles. So what I'm showing here with the color coding, um, so this is R1, no collision. I'm showing the violation scores for the red, the green and the blue trajectory. Mm. So A, obviously is, uh, so A violates uh, collision because it gets too close in here, the other ones do not, and so on. And then when I when compare trajectories, I wanna say that uh, a trajectory is better than another if it only violates low priority rules, right? Very intuitive. And if it happens that they violate rules of the same priority, then I have to look a little bit deeper. I have to look at the violation scores. And obviously I'm gonna pick the one with the least violation score. In this particular example, again, a would definitely be the worst because it has some violation here for the highest priority rule. And then in between B and C, apparently they both violate rules which are equivalent, which have the same priority. So I have to look a little bit deeper and apparently uh, B does better in terms of uh, violating um, R2, so we choose B. Actually, I just realized now that actually it violates blue a little bit more and so on does not, but <laughs> my sample might not be very, but I think you've got the point. I just have to fix this example. Okay, so now uh, uh, I already showed you the dynamics that we used. So I'm not gonna go through details in here, but this, uh, the details are given in this, uh, in this paper. Um, this dynamics are defined along a, uh, a reference trajectory which is actually good for us because we want to do trajectory tracking regardless. 
And also in this particular case, our tracking problem just comes to making two of the state's variables converge to desired values. So we can easily do a trajectory tracking using uh, CLF. And you can see here that the CLF that I'm showing here is slightly different than the one that I showed before, which was a zero here, which basically means that we're gonna relax uh, convergence, we're gonna relax trajectory tracking and in general convergence to some state, which is I think it's a common technique in uh, CBF CLF approach. We always think of uh, convergence as being a soft constraint versus um, a safety being a hard constraint. So you don't wanna relax the barrier functions, but you wanna relax the control diagonal functions. And uh, another ingredient that we use in here, which I'm again hiding under the carpet, is that uh, most of the rules that we have uh, involve clearance. And uh, usually we put boxes around the... Uh... Radom, I'm running out of time, right? Yeah, kind of. I mean, uh, okay. I'm you want to have to questions, you know. Yeah, okay. So basically what we do here, we also find a way to express clearance rules using differentiable functions by over-approximating them. Mm -hmm. And this is the big optimization problem. And what we do here, really, we have an iterative way of uh, relaxing rules. So first of all, we try to find a trajectory that satisfies all the rules. If we cannot, we start relaxing rules of lower priority and hopefully at some point end up with a solution. And here's an example of such an optimal problem, optimal control problem, where basically uh, find a, we cannot find a trajectory that satisfies everything. So we have to uh, compromise and violate R5. And one last point that I want to make is that uh, this uh, method can also be uh, transformed into a pass-fail criterion where you're giving a uh, candidate trajectory and you see how bad it does in terms of violating these rules. And if you're using your optimal control approach, you can find one which does better in the sense that I defined before, then you can pass or fail this trajectory. And that's it. And again, this is way he did most of the work and these are my collaborators at Motional who are part of this. And also ways co advised by Christos Cassandras. Thank you very much, Karin. Uh, very, very nice talk. So, <clears throat> do we have questions from the audience? If not, I'm going to take advantage of this. So, I have a couple of questions. So, so this control barrier function, I mean, the CBF and CLFs, uh, are they fully determined once you give the dynamics, or there is something to learn there? In the traditional approach, they're given. You actually have to pick up those uh, class K functions. And then, uh -huh. but in, the, in what we do, and actually there is another approach that we had, which I'm not showing here. You can actually parameterize those, uh, those um, class K functions by having them as power functions. So you can use the powers to increase mm -hmm. visibility. But also in the ADA CBF that I'm showing here, you see that we're actually messing up with this, um, the barrier functions by introducing time varying penalties. Mm -hmm. So actually, in fact, you, you could, in fact, you could write down this, you know, you could use machine learning actually to write down this parameterized uh, CLF and CBFs and, you know, learn only what is, you know, a parameter there. Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have some preliminary results on that and actually other people do that too. I know Aaron has some uh, results on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's, I think our shield is a little bit of that too. Yeah, so yeah, definitely you can use machine learning for that. And would it help if you would uh, make also f of x uh, linear? I mean, uh, like g of x times x uh, plus. Make, making uh, this linear? Yeah, I mean, you, you can transform. Uh, I think you can always transform through a translation f of x. If it has a, a zero, you can make it like g of x times x. Uh, now, let's say age of x times x. Yeah, 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 of course. I mean, you know, the main point is that you want to be able to write down these types of conditions. That's why you need that affine structure. But once you have the affine structure and you can write this, you kind of more or less set in here. But obviously, if you're the linear, you're going to have uh, better complexity. Mm -hmm. But the, again, the affine form is necessary so you can write those. So you can take the lead derivatives and see how the value of the barrier function changes along the trajectories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm just... How did... I mean, I, I was always wondering, how is, how is the control community... I mean, the control community came up with this form, uh, this kind of linear... linear... Uh, uh, or... F I, I find, I find form it. with... Uh, with... I find form with, with a state-dependent coefficients. Yeah. How did they come up with... They tried to say this is kind of like... like linear, but now I have state-dependent... And uh, but, uh, well, I think you know, my, uh, what I know from linear systems. 
Yeah, it's kind of feels weird. I mean, Paolo, why don't you take over? I think this question is more for you. Um, yeah, so it has been shown that even if the dynamics, that is the right-hand side of the differential equation, is completely non-linear in X and U, mm -hmm. there is a simple trick you can do to always recover this form. And mm -hmm. this simple trick is to say that rather than choosing U, we're going to choose the derivative of U. It's like adding an integrator. Uh -huh. And by doing that simple trick, you always recover this form. So with no loss of generality, one can assume that the, the systems would be of this form. But there are many, but most systems are directly of this form. So from basic physics, G would be a force acting there, and we can change the magnitude of the force. So the U is us changing the magnitude, and G dictates the direction in which the force is pushing. And, and F is a drift that you don't have any control over and you have somehow fight it with the control directions that you have in the G. Uh -huh. Yeah, very nice, very nice. All but right, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Ken. No, no, no. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, but you yeah, don't want to, to cut out, you know. So. No, what I'm saying is that, you know, it's uh, most mechanical systems actually have this form. So it's not a restrictive, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because I'm, my my modeling and it's kind of like a mechanical system. So if you model neurons with uh, uh, as capacitors, you end up exactly with this form. You know that's kind of interesting for me. Uh, you know, so that, that's why I got interested in this form that you guys are using. <laughs> I I still have to find out to 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 use that form. You know, uh, to take advantage more of it. All right, so. Kalin, here is your applause. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. Um, I don't know how to stop sharing. <laughs> to stop sharing now.